October 3rd, and this is the first afternoon session at 2.15. <coughs> okay, so we're going to continue now with the explanation of Samatha Serenity Meditation in the Comprehensive Manual of Abhidhamma. So this morning we completed our survey, brief survey, of the 40 meditation subjects. And now we move on to the next topic, <coughs> which is that of the temperaments. Temperaments means character types. And the early teachers in the Theravada tradition have developed a kind of typology of characters which is determined not by, it's not a rival to any scheme of characters that might have been developed by modern psychology, but rather the purpose is to lay out basic character types from the standpoint of meditative development in order to determine what meditation subjects are suitable for people of what character types. And so if you turn to page 330, and now we're in section number three, you can see that there are three, I'm sorry, that there are six character types that are recognized. So this is the, I'm sorry. No, that's correct. <laughs> it's on page 330, it mentions the six character types so we have the lustful, the hateful, the deluded. Those are the types whose characters are governed by the three unwholesome roots. You know, the three unwholesome roots are greed or lust, hatred or anger, and delusion. So in some people, one or another of those particular unwholesome roots is predominant. And so this person is said to be of such and such a character type, even though our characters are really very complex mixtures of all of these unwholesome roots. But from the standpoint of determining what meditation subject is appropriate, one looks for what is the dominant trait within one's character. What determines one is belonging to a character of such and such a type. And that can be either greed or lust, hatred or anger, or delusion. Those are three that are on the de definite unwholesome side. Then there are three other character types. These are called the faithful, the one whose character is dominated by faith. We could call this also the devotional type. Then the intellectual type, or the type that's disposed to analysis, investigation, who has a strong inclination towards the development of wisdom. And then there is the discursive, the one whose mind is dominated by the mental factor of vitaka, that is discursive thought. This is sometimes also called the speculative type, the type that is always trying to figure things out, um, that's always pondering matters, um, not necessarily with wisdom, but trying to figure, the person who's trying to figure things out intellectually, And then it's said that these six temperaments fall into three pairs, 
according to opposition. So it's said that the lustful type and the faithful or devotional type form one pair. And what is it that unites them? What binds them together is that both are seeking for something attractive. Both have a positive evaluation of their object. And so the lustful type is always looking, okay, where are the pretty girls? <laughs> ah, what nice hair, nice manner of movement, beautiful eyes. So looking for positive features that arouse sensuality, or it could be with food. Ah, uh, I like my very refined food. Um, this is grade B Chinese restaurant, doesn't measure up to my expectations. I want to go only to grade A restaurants. Connoisseur of fine wines. So they have a positive evaluation of the object, but in ways that are going to provoke desire. And then in contrast, the faithful type is the one who is looking for, for example, spiritually lofty ideals. Not necessarily in a good way because they can easily be taken in by phony gurus who put on a show of spiritual, <coughs> spiritual excellence. But the devotional type, the faithful type, is drawn towards persons, teachings, practices that awaken this devotional feeling, this mood of faith. And so they tend to have a positive evaluation of the object in ways that inspire trust, confidence, faith, and devotion. Okay, it's said that the hateful and the intellectual type also form a pair. In that they are both inclined to look for faults. <laughs> so the hateful type <laughs> is always looking for defects in its object. So you show the hateful type the most beautiful girls, and they'll find, <laughs> ah, the hair is too short, the wrong color, the smile is phony, <laughs> the way of movement is too affected. You bring them to the most delit, to, you serve them the most delicious food, they'll think, ah, no good. Not good enough. So they're always searching for shortcomings and faults which will provoke their anger and resentment. So that is the nature of anger, is even when presented with things that are excellent, to find grounds that are going to provoke feelings of ill will. Whereas the intelligent type is looking intelligently for faults. This is because the intelligent type is the one who investigates and examines the nature of appearances and sees behind appearances the underlying, what we call in Buddhism, the adinava, the danger behind the pleasant and gratifying appearance of things. Okay, and then the deluded and the discursive types also form a pair. And the explanation given is that a deluded person vacillates because of superficiality, while a discursive or speculative type does so due to facile speculation. And the Visuddhi Magga gives a very detailed explanation of these, of these six character types, particularly focusing on the differences between the three 
primarily unwholesome types, the greedy type, the hateful type, the deluded type. It explains the differences between how they walk, the differences in their footprints, how you could tell the types on the basis of their footprints, the differences in the way they eat, the differences in the way they use a broom to sweep their premises. And I think sometimes when the Visuddhi Mug is explaining the differences in these types, it resorts to exaggeration in order to bring out the salient characteristics of these character types. Okay, now as I, as I said before, these character types are presented not in order to pr provide a complete analysis of different types of personality, but rather to lay out a framework for assigning appropriate meditation subjects. And I'm not sure that I agree in all respects with the commentaries in their decisions about relation of meditation subjects to character types, but this is the way they assign meditation subjects. Okay, for I have it on the board here. For the lustful type, the appropriate meditation subjects are said to be the ten kinds of foulness, that is the ten stages and the decomposition of a corpse, and mindfulness directed to the body, that is the mindfulness of the 32 parts of the body. So here we can see a direct um, application in the way that these meditations focus upon the unpleasant, disagreeable, <sighs> repulsive nature of the body. And so they are intended to counteract the tendency of lust to seize upon bodily beauty as a means of provoking desire. Okay, so we have 11 meditation subjects considered appropriate for the lustful type. Then for the hateful type, the hating type, they recommend the four illimitables, that is beginning with loving kindness, compassion, altruistic joy. And then the four color casinas, that is the blue, red, yellow, and white casinas. And this strikes me a little bit puzzling in one respect, and that is the red casino. Because usually we take red to be a color associated with anger, or at least with emotional excitement. And so I would think that a red casino could inflame somebody who has a tendency to anger and hatred. But I would certainly say that a blue the color blue, for some reason, has a very peaceful quality to it. Like when we look up at the clear blue sky, it makes us feel peaceful. And so the blue casino and maybe the white casino can be highly recommended for those disposed to hatred and anger. I want to skip over the deluded and discursive temperaments for a moment, then come to the faithful or devotional temperament. For a person of this temperament, we could readily see that the six recollections would be highly appropriate, especially the devotional recollection of the three jewels, the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. Okay, then for the intellectual temperament, the texts recommend the recollection of death, the recollection of peace, the perception of the repulsiveness of food, and the analysis of the four elements. That could be because these meditation subjects require 
a fair amount of reflective thought and also at least a recollection of death, repulsiveness of food, analysis of the four elements, bring to light the unsatisfactory, the faults hidden beneath the pleasant or delightful appearances of things. Okay, it said for, the, for, for both the deluded and discursive temperaments, mindfulness of breathing, anapanasati, is the appropriate meditation subject. And one could see how that would be the case for somebody of a discursive temperament, somebody who is disposed to engage in a lot of reflective thinking, undisciplined reflective thinking, particularly somebody whose mind is overrun by restlessness and the constant compulsive need to speculate and conjecture and figure things out intellectually, for that person to cut through this overlay of conceptualization, one needs a very simple meditation subject that brings the mind right back into the present, and that is mindfulness of breathing. But it's also said that mindfulness of breathing is appropriate for the deluded type, and it seemed to me that this contradicts something that is said in a sutta where the Buddha says that mindfulness of breathing is not appropriate for everyone, but it's appropriate for one who is not forgetful and who is, has clear comprehension. Because mindfulness of breathing can become a very subtle meditation subject and the mind could easily slip away from the breath. And so if one tends to be forgetful and doesn't have clear comprehension, one could lose track of the breath. And so it would seem that the deluded type doesn't have that steady mindfulness and clear comprehension. But then it occurred to me that maybe this is why mindfulness of breathing is recommended for the deluded type because it's mindfulness of breathing, if it's practiced diligently enough, will bring into being that steady mindfulness and clear comprehension that this type is lacking. Okay, then it said that the remaining subjects are suitable for all temperaments. <laughs> but it occurred to me that it doesn't really leave very much because it's of the remaining subjects, there are the four immaterial objects, but those are appropriate only for those who have already mastered the four jhanas. <laughs> so we don't start off by practicing the base of infinite space or infinite consciousness. But first you have to master the fourth jhana, then you come to the base of infinite space, and then go higher. So, you know, for those who are in beginning position, starting off, or even for those in intermediate, or even those with three jhanas who have not yet mastered the fourth, the four immaterial objects are out. So it leaves the six casinas, which are said to be suitable for all temperaments. Okay, th this is what is said, I have to highlight this, bold face it. This is what is said in the commentaries, which take an extremely scholastic approach, looking for fine details um, and disposed to break things down into categories. And so I would not suggest that you start investigating your character and think, okay, I have a tendency to lust, so I should be heading out to the cre <laughs> cremation ground and find myself a nice corpse to meditate on. <laughs> or 
remember I consider myself an intellectual type and therefore I'll start doing the meditation on <laughs> the repulsiveness of food. But my suggestion is that one should use sort of as one's root meditation subject, one's fundamental meditation subject, a non-conceptual or formless meditation object like the mindfulness of breathing or one could be doing the observance of the rise and fall of the abdomen or observation of the sensations in the body, the feelings in the body, or the direct contemplation of states of mind. Because those meditation subjects, because they're in a sense formless and colorless, they help bring to light the different ways in which our minds are working. And also on their own, they're highly conducive to the strengthening of mindfulness and clear comprehension. But if one finds that one has a disposition to one of these character types, one can, one can add to one's regular meditation practice occasional practice of one of these other meditation subjects, perhaps for short periods, like for adding it like for 10 minutes to one's regular session of meditation, or occasionally devoting a whole period to one of these meditation subjects, or occasionally doing it even for a week. As I said this morning, I don't suggest, unless one has the guidance of a very accomplished teacher, the 10 corpse meditations. But one can do the 32 parts of the body if one has the lustful temperament, if one has a disposition to anger or hatred, one could add the loving-kindness meditation. And I would say for everybody, occasionally, the recollection of death is very beneficial for the reasons that I mentioned this morning, that it helps us sort out our priorities in life. It reminds us of the need to devote ourselves to avoid unwholesome behavior and to cultivate wholesome behavior and it arouses that sense of urgency, that sense that we have to use this life to practice the Dhamma and to seek the ultimate goal. Maybe I'll ask at this point whether there are bef any questions pertaining directly to these temperaments and to the assignment of meditation subjects according to the temperaments? Okay, Regina, Regina, there should be somebody with the microphone. Thank you so much, Monte. Um, in regard to the temperaments, let's say, for example, someone has um, a hateful temperament and they practice metta. Is the temperament something that can be attenuated or changed? Oh, definitely, least? definitely. So it's not something that you have, like, that defines you forever? Okay. I don't think so. Okay, thank you. John, born, yeah. Hi, uh, I was wondering if it works the other way around. If you're drawn to a particular meditation, does it reveal something about your temperament? Oh, definitely, I would say that's the case. Even if one is not aware of one's temperament, but by virtue of one's temperament, one might be attracted to one meditation subject or another. But one might be also avoiding a particular meditation subject unknown to oneself or unconsciously because it's runs against the grain of one's character. Uh, I have a question. Sally, that's yes. just, okay. Thank you, Vodhi. I have a question that um, just now I just uh, used the uh, uh, compassion, the e nimptness, uh, yeah. the four e nimptable yeah, meditation yeah. matter. And then when I use, for example, compassion, yeah. 
uh, it's very easy for me to get very uh, emotion. I want to cry for yeah, those people who yeah. are suffering or yeah, yeah. people who are suffering. Uh, is that normal or what should we do when we have very strong emotion? Okay, okay that's a good those? question. So the question is that when she does like the meditation on compassion, she gets moved very strongly emotionally. In that case, what I would say it's to withdraw from the compassion for a few, maybe for a few minutes, and then just do something like the awareness, the mindfulness of the breathing, till the mind settles down, and then go back into the compassion. Okay, I want to get, was there some other immediate question? Uh, another, just... <laughs> okay. It's, it's okay, I can ask you. Okay, you could ask it. Uh, just the, uh, so, then for those except the mindfulness of breathing, other kind of feel some wandering thoughts. I can't f tell the difference. For, for dealing with wandering thoughts? Yeah, I mean, when pr for example, when practice inim for inimitable, yeah. I'm not sure I'm pract practicing it right or, I'm, or those are wandering thoughts. I'm not sure it's right. Um, I'm asking, so, for example, the mindfulness of breathing, then yeah. it's just the observe the fact. Yeah, yeah. But other matter, like for, uh, for inimitable, yeah. those kind of thing, when you, you have to think. So yeah, right, I, yeah. I, 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 I can't tell the difference. Sometimes I'm having wandering thoughts. I see, okay, okay. Yeah, the mind might wander, but this is why what I sug suggest, in fact, what, you know, what the teachers of the tradition suggest is using this formula so that each time one calls to mind, brings to mind a particular phrase that helps bring up that quality, and just for a few moments after putting the phrase through the mind, one generates that feeling that corresponds to the phrase and then moves on to the next phrase and going like this in the cycle with each of the persons. So this prevents the mind from wandering too much. One is using discursive thought in this meditation in the initial stages as it builds up power then it becomes less necessary to use thinking. But just the phrase, one could bring up the phrase, and then that feeling occurs, and you know, the role of thought becomes increasingly minimized until in the higher stages, one could drop thought completely and one can just bring up that quality of loving kindness or compassion without formulas. Okay, I want to move on now to the next subject. And this is in the text, it's called Analysis of Development. And this the first part of this is to show which meditation subjects lead to which stages of development. And first one has to distinguish that there are three stages of concentration. The first is called preliminary concentration. And Pali, this is Parikama Samadhi. The second stage, when the concentration is becoming deeper and stronger, is called access concentration, also n rendered neighborhood concentration, because the mind is coming closer to the full absorption of the jhanas. And then the third stage is called full absorption, and that is the stage beginning with the first jhana.
And then the absorption concentration is divided into, in the sutta system, eight stages, the four jhanas, and then the four immaterial or formless attainments. In the Abhidhamma system, the jhanas are divided into five, as we'll see as we go along. Okay, so the text says that the preliminary stage of development, that is preliminary concentration, is attainable in all these 40 subjects of meditation. I mean, no matter what subject of meditation one practices, at the beginning, as the mind becomes focused on that meditation subject, there'll be some degree of concentration, and that is called preliminary samadhi. Okay, then it says that in ten subjects of meditation, only access development is attained, but not absorption. So these ten subjects of meditation are eight recollections it just says, that the manual just says, recollection of the Buddha and so forth. But I've put on this table, I've laid them out. They are the six recollections. <laughs> well, maybe this isn't <laughs> much better. But it's the recollection of the Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, the um, virtue, virtuous behavior, generosity, and the deities. So those six recollections, then the recollection of death, the recollection of peace, the perception of the repulsiveness of food, and the analysis of the four elements. Okay, these kinds of meditations involve extensive use of discursive thought. And so when one is recollecting the qualities of the Buddha, one has to turn over in one's mind those particular qualities. When one is recollecting death, one has to think again and again about how death is inevitable. And similarly with the other subjects. As one goes along and proceeds with those meditation subjects, one can gradually dispose more and more of the use of discursive thought until the mind is using what we might call discursive thought at a fer to a very minimal degree, but still because some degree or some exercise of thought is necessary, that thought prevents these subjects of meditation from proceeding, for, it prevents these subjects of meditation from serving as a basis for full absorption. That is what is said in the commentarial method. But I've heard an opinion that with the recollection of the Buddha, particularly if one focuses upon the image of the Buddha and leaves aside the reflection on the qualities of the Buddha, but just visualizing the image of the Buddha, one can gain absorption with the Buddha, the image of the Buddha as the object. And if one takes, this is what I've heard some practitioners have told me about other practitioners, <laughs> that they begin with recollection of the Buddha, visualizing the image of the Buddha, then once they gain access concentration based on the Buddha, since they're visualizing the image, they'll take a color from the Buddha image, like it could be the sort of reddish brown of the robe, or the yellow of the skin, the gold of the skin, gold colored skin, to serve as a color on the basis of which they'll turn the meditation to the casinas and then gain absorption. So one uses the 
image of the Buddha, we could say, as a springboard to the color kasina as a means of gaining absorption. Okay, next we have the ten kinds of foulness and the mindfulness directed to the body, these meditation subjects, it said, can lead only to the first jhana and not to the higher jhanas. You know, there was some explanation at the bot and the guide to section 15, the ten kinds of foulness occupied with the body both require, well, I should have done it this way. Okay, these meditation subjects can lead only to access concentration. All of the other meditation subjects are capable of leading to absorption. Okay, and now we have the distinction by way of the jhanas. Let us do it that way, sort of rewind a little bit and go back to the level of jhanas to which the meditation subjects can lead following the text of the manual. So it says, now I'm in section 15, that the ten casinas and mindfulness of breathing can produce five jhanas. That's the five jhanas of the Abhidharma scheme. In the Sutta scheme, it will be four jhanas. So these meditations, the kasinas and mindfulness of breathing, <clears throat> have extremely simple objects and so all one is doing is focus, one is making almost no use of discursive thought, but just using thought enough to keep the mind simply on the casina or on the breath. So if it's the casina, say one is doing the blue casina, one is just focusing on blue, blue, blue. For this I had to go to graduate school, blue, blue. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, blue, blue, blue. And that's what one is doing from morning to night, is focusing on the blue casino. If one is doing mindfulness of breathing, it's just breathing in, breathing out, breathing in, breathing out. And in time, focusing on the breath will bring the, what is the nimitta, the visualized object. And then one focuses on that. And so the mind can go deep, deep, deep into the level of the fourth jhana. Okay, now it says that the ten kinds of foulness, or the ten stages of the decaying corpse, and mindfulness occupied with the body will produce only the first jhana. And then the explanation for this is given in the guide that these 11 meditation subjects both require the exercise of vitaka, that's thinking, and thus they are incapable of inducing the jhanas higher than the first, which are free from vitaka. But I think that's not a sufficient explanation. I found a better explanation in the Visuddhi Magga, which says that because those meditation subjects are repulsive, somewhat repulsive, and so the mind tends to turn away from them, and so one has to constantly use some effort or exertion to keep the mind tied to those meditation subjects. And so that extra exertion and that extra use of the thinking faculty to keep the mind anchored on those meditation subjects 
will prevent the mind from going to deeper levels of absorption. But what I've heard through the grapevine is that some meditators begin using the skeleton as their object of meditation, then once they gain strong concentration on the skeleton, even the first jhana on the skeleton, they can discard the skeleton itself as the object and just focus on the whiteness of the skeleton and then take the whiteness as the meditation object. And in that case, they're doing a kind of derivative white casino. And by focusing on the whiteness, that provides the basis for concentration to go into deeper levels of jhana. Okay, then it says that the first three illimitables or immeasurables, that's loving kindness, compassion, altruistic joy, induce, here it says four jhanas because it's referring to the Abhidhamma five jhana system. But in the sutta system, the more usual system, we would say that they induce, can induce the three lower jhanas, but not the fourth. And the reason given is that these three meditation subjects, including compassion, are accompanied by pleasant feeling. That's sukha vedana. And pleasant feeling exists in the first three jhanas of the sutta scheme but not in the fourth jhana. In the fourth jhana, pleasant feeling is replaced by neutral feeling, the feeling that's neither pleasant nor painful. And then it says that equanimity that is the fourth immeasurable state, the fourth Brahma-vihara, produces the fifth jhana only, but in the sutta scheme, that is the fourth jhana only. And that is because when equanimity reaches the level of jhana, it's accompanied by neutral feeling by the feeling that's neither pleasant nor painful. And so in the first three jhanas, the feeling is pleasant feeling, so that can't coexist with equanimity as a meditative absorption. So when equanimity reaches the level of a meditative absorption, then it's accompanied by neutral feeling, and so it must be at the level of the fourth jhana. However, in the preliminary stages, one can be, this is before jhana, one can be doing the meditation on equanimity without the aim necessarily of reaching jhana, but just to develop an attitude of equality and impartiality towards beings. And then it can be accompanied by pleasant feeling or neutral feeling. And normally what is said in the meditation manuals, if one wishes to develop equanimity as to the jhanic level, one first has to master one or another of the preceding three Brahma-viharas master it to the level of the third jhana. After one accomplishes the third jhana, say based on loving kindness, then one can proceed 
to develop the reflections that will bring equanimity at the level of the fourth jhana. But for our day-to-day -day practice, if we want to, you know, to develop an attitude of equanimity in the mind, of equality, impartiality, free from favoritism and resentment towards others, then we could simply do the appropriate reflections that prepare the way for the attainment of equanimity. And then the text here concludes that these 26 meditation subjects produce the fine material sphere jhanas. I think that covers the material that I had for the session. So if there are any questions, we have a few minutes before the end of this period. So if there are any questions, then please feel welcome to ask them. Let's give... Okay, Ed. Technically better than I am. Um, thank you, Bonte. Uh, I, on equanimity, I recall hearing, reading, in a couple of places about an equanimity based, I think, on unity and an equanimity mm. based on diversity. Could you explain those, number one, and number two, how does it relate to, let's say, the Brahma Vihara meditation on equanimity? Yeah, I don't want to go into any details about that now because that's not really directly related to the meditation subject. Just very briefly, the equanimity that's based on unity there, that is the equanimity that exists in the fourth jhana. And then that is contrasted with the equanimity based on diversity, that is the equanimity that one might develop in one's day-to-day -day life sort of an indifference towards the different diverse objects of the senses. Are there different meditation, let me call them forms, that are yeah. directed at these two types? The equanimity of the fourth jhana can be developed through any of the meditation subjects that will lead to all four jhanas. Mm -hmm. okay. The equanimity based on diversity is not a meditative equanimity. Mm. Okay, thank you. Okay, right here. Thank you. Thank you, Bhante. My name is Steve. Is there a difference between Parikama Samadhi and Kanaka Samadhi? Okay, this is an important question. But I think I'm going to shelve the question now because I'm going to bring up Kanika Samadhi tomorrow. And so then we'll have a chance to, you know, to look at it. Um, <laughs> if I mind for, <laughs> I mean, I know you so well, but <laughs> I mean, I of course. <laughs> uh, so, Bhantiji, you mentioned about three stages of concentration. About three stages of concentration. Yeah, yeah. And within that, the full absorption had eight stages and four jhanas. Yeah. So where is the fifth jhana? Okay. I, 
I have this for more detailed treatment in the second part of the afternoon session, but let me just say that you, you'll see it when we come to the second part of the, the afternoon session. Okay, please. Um, would you say jhanas are like a mechanical skill that have to be like kept up, like even if you access it once, if you don't practice it, you lose your ability to access it? Yes, definitely. One has to repeatedly practice in order to maintain it. And if one doesn't repeatedly practice, one will lose it. And would you also say like, your, if you obtain a jhana, would that immediately reflect in your ability to focus on other things? I would think so. Okay. Since in order to achieve the jhana, one needs a very, very strong capacity for concentration. And so that capacity for concentration will carry through into other activities. Cool. And um, Cindy, correct? Right here. Thank you, Bhante. Uh, I'm interested in uh, how fear uh, can be included in, in this analysis. How? As a, a fear, is a, I'm understanding it's related to the hateful or aversion, um, fear mm. instead of hate. Um, but I've also read that it can be related to, um, to desire or craving. I mean, for that one, we'd have to undertake an extensive psychology of fear. Mm. But I would say that fear is probably quite closely connected with craving, mm. because fear is the fear of losing the right. objects of desire. Right. Thank you. But maybe my explanation is oversimplistic, but that's just an off-the-bat answer to that. Thank you, Bhante. Okay, and Born, he is... With the black. Yeah, okay. in the insight first, uh, serenity afterwards model, yeah. that samadhi that's generated, does yeah. that rise to the jhanic level? Because no, that is the kanika samadhi, primarily the kanika samadhi, which I'm going to deal with tomorrow okay. when we come to the vipassana, the, the vipassana stage. Okay, one... But you always ask complex questions. But okay, let's take Ming. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you, Bandy. Um, my question is like excess concentration, you gave a sample for the six recollections yeah. you used the Buddha Nusadi, like yeah. take that example. But Buddha Nusadi, somehow you can get a form out of that, like you have a picture of Buddha. Yeah. Then we think about uh, Dhamma Nusadi. If we practice Dhamma Nusadi, if we get to say at that level, if we want to go deep from that method, yeah. what way to I see, I see. Go? Actually, this is a very good question. And this had been a question that has been sort of pressing on my own mind. Like how meditations like Recollection of the Dhamma, recollection of the Sangha, recollection of moral behavior, generosity, how they can lead to access concentration. Because when we look at the explanation of access concentration in the Visuddhimagga, it seems almost like it's meditation on the edge of jhana, not quite fully absorbed, but focusing very, very precisely and single-mindedly on a single object. Someplace, I think it was in Mahasi Soyador's Manual of Insight, he gave the good explanation that there are actually two types of access concentration. One is the access concentration which is developed through a meditation subject that is designed to lead to jhana. So that is the access at the verge of the jhana, or the access or the concentration that's a
approaching the jhana and that has the, the qualities capable, if, one's if, it, if one is pursued strongly enough, the capacity to bring the jhana. That is what we can call a true or genuine access concentration. The meditation subjects like the recollections, mindfulness of death, mindfulness of the re or recollection of the repulsiveness of food, don't bring that kind of access concentration. But rather, Mahasi Soyador said that this can be called access concentration in a somewhat secondary sense, in the sense that the use of those meditation subjects will be sufficient to suppress the five hindrances and disturbing and distracting thoughts and to serve as a sufficient basis for going on to insight. And so in that sense, they're called access concentration, not because they are leading to the, not because they are tending towards the jhanic attainment. Okay, with that, we should take a, we'll take a 20 minute break. So we come back, we'll hit the boards at 3.30 and we'll start 3.35.